Uh, my name is Adam Cohen. I'm the Ichthyology Collection Manager at the University of Texas's Biodiversity Collections. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about today about our American Eels in Texas project, which is the collaborative projects with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And I'll start by simply plugging our um, Fishes of Texas project, which is a uh, essentially a databasing project where we've taken museum databases like our own and merged them into a single database. Um, so we have 42 other contributing data donors from museums all over the world. Um, of, their, of just their Texas specimens. And so now we can get a pretty good picture of um, where and when fish species were collected across the state. So if you're interested in Texas fishes, go to www.fishesoftexas.org so you can learn more. Um, this is the life cycle of the American eel. And they start off as eggs drifting about in their Sargasso Sea in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, from there, they have one of the most interesting life cycles of, of most animals in, on, on Earth. Um, they hatch out into these leptocephalus larvae, which are these, uh, they look like willow leaves, but they're entirely transparent. You can see through them. Um, and then they drift about in the currents, uh, wherever the currents take them. They have some swimming ability, but not very much. Um, if, when they get in the continental shelf and closer towards fresh water, they start to transform into what they call a glass eel. And these look more like what most people think of an eel, but they're still very transparent. And then they start to um, go up into the fresh waters, into rivers and streams in mass, where they start to transform into what's called an elver, which is a small looking eel. They lose the transparency, but they can go up for quite a distance. Um, they've gone up to Mississippi, all the way to Minnesota. Um, so, and they can, they can stay up in those fresh waters for up to 20 years. The females are thought to go further upstream and may persist up in fresh water longer than the males who stay towards the coast more. Um, that's not really known for sure what's going on in Texas. Most of this is, most of what we know about American eels comes from the East Coast where um, they're in very large numbers. Uh, the project we're working on now is to investigate the Gulf of Mexico population, including Texas. So hopefully we'll learn more, more about them. Um, eventually, um, they reach maturity, 20 years or so, and in, in, in a synchronized fashion, they come back to the Sargasso Sea to mate, and um, they lay eggs, the males release sperm, and then the parents die, and the life cycle starts over again. So it's this really long uh, life cycle, a lot of, a lot of migration. Uh, the yellow arrows here represent another species of eel called the European eel, and it simply stays on this Gulf Stream current longer uh, till they reach Europe. And they, they basically have the same kind of life cycle, but a little bit longer migration. This is a picture of um, the, juvenile, the juvenile phases. This is the leptocephalus. You can see these myomeres, which are its muscles. It has this very long gut. They're thought to feed on plankton floating about in the ocean, but very little is known about their diet. The glass eels, these are often collected in large numbers as they start to enter fresh waters. Um, they're easy to collect there because they kind of congregate uh, at, the, at these mouth, uh, the openings of rivers and creeks. Um, and then these are the elvers. So the eels are kind of, the elvers are known for traversing dams and um, even going on the ceilings of, of crevices and stuff. So they're, they're known for their ability to get through obstacles. One interesting fact about eels is that their sex is not determined by genetics as it is in humans. Their sex is determined by their environment and it's really poorly understood. But when they're forced, when they first hatch, their sex is not determined. They're, they're kind of undifferentiated. So here's a picture of the ovaries of a dissected eel. And there are these white curtain-like structures here. And these are actually pretty small. They get much bigger. Uh, this is a picture of a female uh, what she might look like come, um, when she's closer to the Sargasso Sea about ready to reproduce. Females can produce as much as 22 million eggs. Sigmund Freud, the famous um, psychologist, uh, his first project was studying eels actually. He was trying to find a male eel, which up to then had not been found. Uh, the goal was basically to prove that eels are actually reproducing sexually, so he needed to find both sexes to prove that. 
And eventually he did, but it took a long time. And presumably what's going on is the males uh, don't become obvious until they're out on their way to the Sargasso Sea. And that's when they actually start developing testes. So he must have found one eventually that was um, either developing earlier or he came from, came from the ocean. I threw this slide in here just to illustrate some of the species that people confuse with eels. We get a lot of people telling us that they saw an eel and then they describe it and it becomes pretty clear it actually was not an eel. So I thought this was important for people to see. So this up here is the American eel. And I'm gonna quickly compare it to some of these other species you might see. So here's a snake, this is a rat snake. Species of snake you actually won't see probably too close to the water, but there are many other snakes in the water. But you can see it has very large scales and most of the snakes have very large scales. So the American eel has uh, no obvious scales, but if you look underneath the skin or kind of through the skin, you can see there are tiny scales that are subcutaneous and they're also kind of interdigitated. They have a very unique pattern. So that's, that's fairly diagnostic for eels. Uh, other species you might see are these lampreys. This is two species of lampreys we have in Texas. And in between is their, um, their larval form and they're jawless. So um, they're easy to distinguish from eels which have distinctive jaws. This is a species of eel that's been recently introduced to Dallas and uh, Houston. And uh, we don't know if it's gonna persist, but it has been introduced recently. But it, it can easily be distinguished by the fact that the tips of its jaws are even. So they're, up, they're in a vertical line across from each other. But the American eel, the lower jaw, always protrudes past the upper jaw. So that's fairly distinctive. Most people are familiar with eels um, as a food source, um, where they commonly are called unagi. Um, they've, they've long been consumed in Japan, uh, but also Europe and America, not so much anymore in Europe and America. But each of these places, uh, Japan, Europe, and America has their own eel species. They're still very popular in Japan, and that's where the name unagi comes from, it's a Japanese word. Aquaculturists have not been able to uh, reproduce eels and grow them out. Um, they try to, they're trying to reproduce them in the lab, of course, uh, using hormones and, and whatnot, but that's not been possible with eels. They've been able to get them to hatch, but they can't get the full life cycle. So they rely on wild caught glass eels to maintain the industry. And that, um, any of those species of eels can, are used in the, uh, in the, the eel industry. So the wild Japanese glass eels um, have been mostly fished out and uh, European eels have been mostly fished out. Uh, they're no longer allowed to be harvested and that's put a lot of demand and pressure on uh, American eels. And in Maine, glass eels were selling for, uh, in 2012, for $2,600 a pound, which you can imagine with a cost like that puts an incredibly de high demand on, on the fishery. Real quick, the um, conservation milestones. So eels were listed as threatened in Canada in 2012, um, putting even more pressure on the more southerly uh, populations. And um, in 2015, the US Fish and Wildlife considered, um, considering, considered listing them as endangered and decided not to. That's not to say there's no um, regulation on the fishery, there is regulation, but um, they're not listed as endangered. 2017, the IUCN listed them as endangered. This is a illustration showing um, one of our trend analyses for our Fish of Texas project. These are still very preliminary, but uh, I threw the one up here for the American eel to show, it really shows a strong decline over time in its prevalence across the state. Uh, we don't really know this is true. We're not willing to go that far yet, um, but what the point of this is that we think there's much more collections of American eel needing to happen. We need a focused effort on it. Effort on it. One of the things that happens is people um, do not want to keep eels. They, they're hard to collect for one, they're slippery, but also they're often released because people think um, they, they don't want to kill American eel um, to make it a specimen. So we don't know if this trend is actually a true trend telling us something about the biology of the species or it's more of a human affected thing. So we, so part of this project is to really get at that problem. So uh, we started compiling data. 
um, basically occurrence data. So when and where eels were collected. So we looked in the literature, in, including uh, newspaper sources, social media, fishing forums, collectors field notes, scientific museum specimens, citizen science, things like iNaturalist, which some of you are probably familiar with. It's a place, it's a, it's a website where citizens can upload photographs of any species and um, make them available for science. And we've also gone out and collected a bunch of our, a bunch of specimens on our, on our, on our own. And we, now we have over a hundred specimens to, to do scientific analysis with. This map real quickly shows you, um, the blue dots are kind of the more recent dots. And you can see how we have specimens from every basin in the state now. So there are, they are distributed across the state. And it appears that they're getting past some dams, but perhaps being blocked by other dams. Again, this is still developing data and we're not gonna draw conclusions as of yet, but it looks to be there's something going on with dams. Um, but it looks also to be that they're not quite as rare as we had feared, but perhaps more common than, than, we, than we thought. A lot of the people watching this will be interested in our area in Austin, and particularly Barton Springs. They've been collected in Barton Springs in 1884 and have probably been there since. They're still there today. If you can go online and see a picture of an, uh, a video of an eel on YouTube from Barton Springs, but they're periodically reported from the springs. And there's another article in the Statesman about an eel that was collected in 2012 from Lady Bird Lake. This specimen is now in our collections. The question is how do they get past Longhorn Dam to get up into uh, Lady Bird Lake and Barton Springs? And it's really not known. Perhaps those eels are really old eels and they were there before the dam was built. Or more likely they've somehow gotten past the dam uh, there are ways, I can imagine, if you look at the dam, there are um, places where the eels might get past it. Um, another alternative is that they've gone through the aquifer. So they've gone into springs and then come up in Barton Springs. We just don't know. So we have these specimens now and we're hoping to learn a lot from them. So from their tissues, we can learn about uh, genetics. We can learn about, is this Texas Gulf of Mexico population the same population as the Sargasso population, we think so, but we don't really know for sure, and that should be addressed. Um, isotope ratios, isotope ratios in the tissues can tell us about its, um, any individual's position on the food web. So we can see, is it eating high up, um, eating, you know, that means like, is it eating predators or predators or predators, or is it eating low down closer to the primary producers? We can also learn if an individual um, is coming from a saltwater environment or a freshwater environment, we can learn about toxins such as mercury. From their stomach and guts, we can see what their last meal was. So we can look at that and come up with an idea of what they're eating. Gonads can tell us about whether it's a male or female or if it's undifferentiated and how mature it is. By looking at the swim bladders, we can try to detect this um, new invasive parasite called Anguilicoloides crassus. It's a parasite of the swim bladder from Japanese eels. Uh, looking at their otoliths, which are these tiny bones in their skulls, they're used for balance, but they're useful for scientists for detecting, uh, determining age. So there's these annular rings that are laid down. Every year they lay a new one down, just like tree rings. And you can count them to, to learn how old any individual fish is. And you can also look within these and look at isotope, isotope ratios at different stages in the eel's life and determine perhaps what habitat it lived in. So did it live in salt water when it was one and maybe it moved to fresh water and then maybe it moved back to salt water, maybe back to fresh water. You can kind of see how it's moved around throughout its lifespan. Okay, I'll quickly show you some of the eel specimens I have here. Um, let's see if I can do this. Okay, so here's um, some of our medium sized specimens. We have larger specimens and smaller specimens. Here's one of the particularly small ones, but we have some that are slightly smaller than this. Um, and then we have larger specimens. So from these, I just wanted to show you kind of what they look like and um, you can see what we're doing to them. This is where the tissues are coming out 
rather large tissue samples so we can do all the stuff I just mentioned. We cut them open and then we stitched it back up, but you can see the hole here where we're um, taking, um, looking at the swim bladder and the guts and looking for parasites. And then each one of these has been dissected to get the otoliths out from the top of its mouth there. There's two little holes that we drill out to extract the otoliths. And of course, we'll hold on to these specimens indefinitely because there's uh, many potential uses for them down the road. So some of the questions we're hoping to answer from these are, uh, what's the sex ratio? Um, for example, we already know that uh, from what we've done that they're skewed towards females. Um, what parasites? We know there's at least two species of parasites that we've seen, including that Japanese invasive parasite. When do they enter Texas rivers um, and do they do it in mass? What age and time of year do, uh, they, do they migrate back to sea? And um, are they going back and forth between fresh and salt water? Maybe one sex is doing that and the other is not. Um, do they go upstream? And how far upstream are they going? Are both sexes doing the same thing? Okay. Get the screen sharing back on. Okay. So that's the slide I just told you about. Um, one of the mysteries about American eels is um, how they're getting to Texas, basically. Um, it's really interesting that very few glass eels or leptocephala have been collected from the Gulf of Mexico. And um, that begs the question, why not? Um, if they're getting here, you would expect them to be getting here via the same path via the currents um, that they're getting along the East Coast. And um, the answer might be surprising. We just don't know yet. But one idea is that perhaps um, they are metamorphosing along the coast of Florida and going up um, more of an inland route um, uh, through the bays and estuaries and not really occurring so much in the Gulf of Mexico proper. So that would explain why they have not been collected much there. They also might be getting stuck in these gyres. If you look at the, um, the path to get to the Gulf of Mexico from the Sargasso Sea, they have to go all throughout here. And there's lots of these gyres where eels can get stuck in. And some of these gyres persist for a very long time. So they may never make it to the coast. And it might just be that you know every once in a while uh, that some eels make it to the coast. So it could be that it's a periodic kind of thing where they make it to the coast. Alternatively, they could just be there and, and they have not been collected very much. It could just be a, a sampling kind of thing. We just don't know yet. Another interesting mystery is the fact that there are no archeological records of Gulf of Mexico eels. Um, so uh, the drainage of the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, it, they should be obvious in archeological sites because their vertebrae are distinctive. Vertebrae are often preserved in archeological sites. And they've been preserved frequently in European and even North American on the East Coast um, uh, archeological sites. So it's not, it's not something unique for an eel to occur in an archeological site if they're present. So there, there are eel records from Texas uh, dating back to the 1850s and those are the earliest records we have. So we have to wonder like, were they not here um, um, during, during early human times? Uh, maybe they were only here in the last four to five centuries. Uh, so that's really an interesting kind of thing. It could have just been overlooked in the archaeological record too. We just don't know. So this is my last slide. And I just encourage you to um, let us know if you've seen an eel or you have an eel specimen um, that you can contribute to our project. We're interested in any knowledge you have about eels in Texas. If you are uh, have knowledge, just go to the Hendrickson Lab website at the bottom of the page here and let us know. Thank you.